All right, everybody, welcome back. Totally Driven Radio. And, uh, hey, Santa. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. All right, I got to let here. you go. My guest, my guest is on the line. You're a jerk. You just couldn't bump. <laughs> so you get to save your you get to save your stories for your show on Tuesday night. Yeah. Now you know what it would like to be the last ten minutes of Totally Driven Radio. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but call me tomorrow and and, and fill me in on uh, how To treated you. I can't wait to hear this. All right, later. All right, man. Later. <laughs> All right, everybody. Here we go. Is this the one and the only Mr. Metal Cowboy himself, Ron Keel? It is indeed, Ron Keel, on the line, and I am totally driven this evening. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Hey, Ron, thank you for being a guest. And I, I, I'm going to tell you a real quick story of uh, my Keel experience before we get into the whole interview. See if you uh, can remember this. We're going to go back in time. I think it was 1985, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You guys played a free show on the back of a flatbed truck in the middle of Center City, Philly. Absolutely. I do remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, it was uh, sponsored by WYSP, the big station. Absolutely. Fine at the time, it was absolutely nuts. I've got some photos of that gig, actually. The streets were jam-packed as far as you could see, and uh, it was a great gig. That's awesome. I got photos, too, which I'm going to have to scan and send over to you. But it's funny because I, uh, I went to dinner the other night with a buddy of mine who uh, I was at that show with, and we were like 15 years old at the time. And that was our first experience with Yukon Jack. <laughs> oh, yeah? Were they the opening band? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as a matter of I was just telling my co-host that we met some weird family. We don't even know, but they just like – started giving us Yukon Jack and we're, you know, enjoying the show and drinking Yukon Jack with these people. And next thing you know, like the one guy just decided to like piss on my buddy's leg as he's standing there. And we're like, he just look, looks at me and goes, the guy just peed on me. I'm like, what? <laughs> and his like leg is drenched. I'm like, okay, better you than me. Well, you got better stories than I do, man. You should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told that, but we're going to talk about your book because your book's more important because it's actually real and it's out now. <laughs> it is. Well, I'm glad to talk about that and whatever else you want to talk about tonight. Sounds like you guys got the party started without me. What a great show you've got. First of all, let me give you a high five long distance and, and big props. Uh, it's a great show, very entertaining, and it uh, sounds like you guys are having a great time doing it, and I'm glad to be a part of it this evening. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we are having a place, and we're going to have a place for you. And it sounds like you, like – are really having a blast with everything. Like, as I look over your stuff and all, and you think, like, you would think, like, back in the 80s, you would think you were busy and all, but it seems like now, like, you're ten times busier because you're going in every different direction. I mean, you just wrote a book. You have your new album that just came out, Metal Cowboy. You're doing a radio show. You're doing a a country stage show or something. I, I mean... You're doing everything. I'm on tour. Start, I believe, leave on the road in a couple of weeks. I'm a, a counselor at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp in Las Vegas. Next week we have Judas Priest coming, help in for Vegas, and I'll be working with those guys next week and uh, producing a recording session in Utah as we speak. Took a break from the sessions to talk to you. Yeah, I'm a hard-working guy. I am, like I said, totally driven. Um, but, you know, I'm, you I'm just a, a regular American guy. I'm, I'm a hard-working small business owner, and that's what we are in this day and age in the business that I'm in. You have to do that, and uh, I've enjoyed exploring these different landscapes and territories, like radio, uh, hosting my own radio show, Streets of Rock and Roll, and now I'm an author, and uh, the book is a longtime dream of mine come true, and, you know, I, I do enjoy my life. I love what I do. I think uh, if you're going to live, man, you might as well have a good time while you're doing it, and uh, that's my motto, and, and I've, I've been able to, to, to translate my dreams and, and create creativity into uh, a way of life and, and a way to make a living and i am very thankful thankful for those opportunities uh but you know these this day and age you have to be i think a guy like myself i, I work five times as hard as i did in the 80s to achieve maybe one-fifth as much because of the nature right. of the business the nature of society that the way things are, are happening now i have to do all this stuff and really it's uh I, I thought I'd try my hand at radio uh, because uh, it was a way to entertain people, which is my primary goal. And now we have over 50 stations, and uh, I'm able to, to play what I want, say what I want, do what I want on the streets of rock and roll every week. Totally enjoy that. Um, 
and uh, I, I do enjoy the work. Sometimes it feels like uh, I've bitten off more than I can chew, but, uh, <laughs> man, if, if I don't like it, I'll just spit it out. Now, and, and one thing you said there, too, was, like, it's a business, and, and, like, you've made, like, you know, the Ron Keel business, and it's a brand now, too, as well. Like, it, it's not just where it's you're focused on your music. You have all these different outlets you're doing, and it is a business, and, and, and I, I know, like, Going back to, like, in the 80s, like, when was a kid like myself, the teenage uh, kid, like, wanting to be that dream of being that rock star like Ron Keel, but I never, like, thought about the whole business end of it. <laughs> well, that's why they call it the music business. And, of course, when you're young, you think you've got uh, the futures ahead of you and there's a lot of road left to, to travel down, and you kind of roll with it and you figure uh, – that uh, you can survive anything, and and I have. I, I'm proud of the fact that I have survived. I've been able to continue living my dream, creating music and creating entertainment for a living, doing what I love to do, and doing it on a level of which I'm very proud. Uh, I think that I'm doing my best work now at this uh, stage of my career, and even with the last Kill record, Streets of Rock and Roll. I, I do believe, and I'm not just uh, blowing smoke or, or painting it, a uh, different color. I think that's the best Keel record ever. It blows away the stuff we did in the 80s. I think my new Metal Cowboy CD is the best uh, songs and the best vocals of my career. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the radio show, the book, and all that stuff. And, you know, uh, I don't want to slow down. I don't want to stop. I just want to keep on doing what I love to do and entertain people along the way. Well, you know, with and again, with all these projects, you look at today and, you know, you're doing all these things. And not just you, like a, a lot of guys um, from the era of the 80s, they're doing maybe not as much as you, but they're all doing different projects. And even t people today in the, the modern genre of hard rock are doing the same thing or, you know, where you have like, like a Dave Grohl, for instance, who's he'll, he'll do the Foo Fighters and then he's making a, a documentary and he's playing with the – Queens of the Stone Age, and he's doing all this stuff, but you would go back to, like, the 80s, and it was like, there was, like, an unwritten rule that, like, Ron Keel had to do Keel, and you weren't allowed to do anything else. Like, you only were allowed to focus on that one thing. You know, I do. I am thankful that uh, what I am and who I am is now cool and relevant, whereas in the 80s, it wasn't so much. They wanted uh, the larger-than-life rock stars, the guys who were, you know, the, the drugs, the car wrecks, the the, uh, the hedonism, the, the, the sexcapades, so to speak. Right, And I right. was really always, I was, you know, I was always trying to be a nice guy, trying to do the right thing, trying to work hard, trying to play music, and uh, it wasn't really cool back then. They didn't want a down-to-earth uh, guy who was just a, a regular Joe. And, and I'm just like all the rest of the people that are listening to this program, that are out busting their ass every day, that are buying my records, uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a human being. I'm a businessman, and I'm trying to survive and trying to do what I I love to do. But uh, now it's kind of cool that people seem to really embrace the fact that I am down to earth. When I'm on a, an event like the Monsters of Rock Cruise, I can hang right. out with the fans all day long. And uh, I'm not one of those guys who sits in his cabin and orders room service. I'm out there hanging with the people, uh, singing and playing and, and interviewing people for my radio show. And I'll eat with the fans and and uh, just just love hanging out with them and having that personal relationship. They seem to appreciate that now. And, and back in the day, they wanted somebody that was untouchable, so to speak. Right. And I'm very, very, I'm very touchable, by the way. <laughs> so it's, it's cool that, that it's come full circle. And now that, that the guy who I really am and who I, I really want to be is accepted and uh, embraced by, by the fans that are buying my new metal cowboy CD and my book, you can heal life on the streets of rock and roll. Now, well, now it's funny too because like when you um you know the, the '80s everybody went away and then uh, you popped up on one of them VH1 specials uh, whichever one it was and you were it was like, where are they now Especially, yeah. there you go and you were Ronnie Lee Keel and I remember seeing that and I cringed I was like oh no like Ronnie Lee Keel and I, now I have to apologize because after I'm doing all this research I find out that Lee is actually your middle name. My my real name is Ronnie Lee Keel. I had it changed in 1986. My middle name has always been Lee. My last name has always been Keel. And if you buy the book, you can find out what my birth name was uh, at first, but it was changed to Ronnie at a very very early age. Um, and uh, that 
VH1 video is infamous and notorious and was a benchmark in my career because a lot of people had that same reaction that you had. Uh, but I just don't understand it. I never have. I never will. And I don't want to. Um, if I see a guy who one day he's eating Italian food, the next day maybe he wants a salad uh, yeah. or a steak or maybe Mel Gibson or, or Clint Eastwood, these you know, action movie stars, they'll do a comedy. They'll explore right. other territory. They'll they'll expand their talent. They'll stretch the boundaries. And country music gave me a way to survive, to stay creative, to entertain people, to make a living, and to express myself in a way that without it, I probably wouldn't be on the radio with you tonight. Uh, it enabled me to survive with just a guitar and a song and a story to tell. And uh, that was what got me through the 90s when literally it was a dark period for heavy metal, commercial, hard rock, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we weren't cool anymore, dude. And it wasn't that I turned yeah. on the fans. And I, I love the fans, and please don't take this wrong. But the fans turned on us. They stopped buying what we did. If they'd have kept buying what we did, we'd have kept doing it. Um, right. But they grew up. They got married. They went to college. They had lives. They had families. And uh, the next generation uh, was buying Nirvana or Nirvana, whatever you call them, Pearl Jam, <laughs> uh, fans like that. Uh, and we were no longer cool. We were no longer relevant. A lot of my contemporaries back in the day had to resort to other means, whether it was uh, – painting houses or overdosing on drugs. Luckily, right. I was still able to create music and entertain people in a way that I love with country music. And, man, there's a lot of common ground, dude. It's songs about partying and chasing women and drinking. And, you know, it, it's good time uh, entertaining music. And you get to paint the picture with a lot of different colors other than just screaming guitars and screaming vocals, like on my new Metal Cowboy album, which we've kind of married heavy metal and country, we can paint the picture with other instruments like dobro or slide guitar, harmonica, piano, all these other things that uh, we couldn't do on a keel album. Yeah, and, and I was actually going to say that. Like, is this your your first time, like, actually co basically combining the two genres? I mean, you, you took your your hard rock edge and you combined it with your country edge, and you're, you formed the metal cowboy. Well, the songs are, you know, the songs have to come first. And how you treat them is is how they end up sounding. First of all, from country music, I learned that there are no throwaway lines. In lyrics, every line has to say something. It has to mean something. It has to tell a story. You have to create characters, and you have to, to make every line count. Whereas in metal or rock, I mean, there's a lot of stuff on my albums, and, you know, uh, like... Now, I don't want to talk about other bands or their lyrics or whatever, but there's a lot of throwaway lyrics in you know, round and round. You've had enough. I've had enough. I mean, you don't say the same <laughs> phrase twice, man. Say something. Tell me. You right. Find something else that rhymes with enough, dude. Uh, dig deeper. And I had to do that on this record, on a song like The Last Ride, um, which is one of my favorite tunes and one of the heaviest tunes on the Metal Cowboy album. I had a set of lyrics that was okay. You know, it was screaming. It was, you know, it, it was, you know, had the attitude, but, it didn't quite say enough. So I went back and I rewrote the lyrics and ended up with lines like, inside and out, I've earned these scars, from the sunset strip to the cowboy bars. And, man, that's a lyric. That says something. That tells you yeah. who I am and what I'm doing. And uh, you have to dig deep. So it starts with the lyric and uh, telling that story, but also that heavy metal riff-driven rock and roll where you've got the two killer crunching guitars working back and forth with each other. The vocals are screaming. On this new record, I scream my guts out. It's, uh, it's not uh, a country album by any stretch of the word, and if you just listen to the vocals, you'll know that. I was going to say, actually, your vocals at times, which I, I don't know if you want to hear this or not, but it kind of sounds like modern-day Bon Jovi vocals. Well, you know, i got to admit, Bon Jovi was a big influence on me. Uh, when we toured with them, and you look back and you think, well, I toured with them. I was already, I already had three or four albums, actually five albums out by the time we got to tour with Bon Jovi on the Slippery When Wet tour. But really, I was only, what, 25, 26 years old? I was still a kid. Right. Um, and getting to meet John and, and tour with them and seeing their show and seeing what they were doing had a, had a pretty profound influence on my songwriting 
even long before we toured with them, I, I was a big Bon Jovi fan from the first record on. Uh, mm-hmm. I loved the songwriting approach that, that Sean and Richie took. And uh, I was still learning my craft at the time, even though I was selling out arenas and touring the world as a, quote, rock star, man, I, I was still very much in my developmental phase. And Bon Jovi was a pretty strong influence. Uh, I, I, I respect John's uh, songwriting ability. I love the, the fact that he can sing hard and gritty, but also sweet and pretty. You know, And, and I try and right. incorporate some of that in my style. It's just natural. It's just uh, something that we are the sum of our influences, whether it started with the Beatles and 1964, or Bon Jovi in 1987, or whatever I've heard lately. Um, I'm still right. the product of my influences. I'm still a, a fan of music, and I still soak this stuff up like a sponge and kind of uh, transform it into my version of what I'd like to hear. Now, now with the, the country music, were you a big country fan going back before you even ventured into it, or... Was it something you were just kind of like starting to get into as maybe like the late 80s came to a close and you started no, well, getting the idea in your head? And uh, if, if any if, the, if you or any of the fans that, that are listening might want to read my book, Even Keel, Life on the Streets of Rock and Roll, I go into this subject in depth both in my early formative years and later on when I actually, quote, went country, as people like to, like to say. I don't prefer went country. You don't go country. You're either born that way or uh, just like you're born rock and roll. I think I was – born with uh, both the love of both uh, styles of music. I grew up listening to country music. My dad was a country musician who had toured with some of the big guys back in the uh, 40s and 50s. And uh, at the time, it was uh, we were listening to Merle Haggard, Johnny Cash, and all that stuff when I was growing up, but it didn't resonate with me because I hadn't yet been to jail. I hadn't gotten the shit kicked out of me. I had not been divorced. I had not been homeless. Um, so I was attracted to the excitement energy, electricity, and sexuality of rock and roll. Of course, as a teenager, you're growing up, you, you want to hear what's hard and heavy, and I got into Kiss and Alice Cooper and Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, and I loved all that stuff. But um, country music was, and it's not just country, it's you know, singer-songwriter music, guys like John Denver or Jim Croce, guys with a guitar and a song and a story to tell. Um, and it was uh, something that uh, absolutely in my heart, And I don't think you can get up in front of an arena full of rodeo fans and sort of 10,000 shit kickers at a country arena and sing. And, you know, you you don't just put the hat on and and go through the motions, dude, or they will will eat you alive. They will throw bottles at you and they will beat the shit out of you. Uh, You've got to be real. And just like with heavy metal, when you get on stage and you do a metal show or a keel show like I do, those fans wouldn't buy it. We wouldn't still be alive. Kill wouldn't still be rocking like we're going to rock at M3 this year if it wasn't for real. These things come from the heart. And just because uh, I can do one well doesn't mean I can do the other well. These are also skills that I've learned. Country music is an art form. Heavy metal is an art form. You don't, you're not just born heavy metal. You're not born country. You're, these, are, these are art forms that you love and you learn about and you develop your skills in those areas, just like much like a, a mechanic will learn to work on a car or a carpenter will learn to build a house. I learned how to sing heavy metal, dude. I wasn't born knowing how to scream like that. Uh, I also learned how to write a country song, how to entertain an audience, how to get them on the dance floor, keep them dancing, keep them drinking. So these are, you know, it's, it's, it, it has to come from the heart. It has to be real, but it's also a skill that you have to work on and learn and perfect and continue to develop as you progress throughout your career. Well, I mean, I, I can tell you about myself. Like growing up in, as a kid in the seventies, growing up in actually a kids fan, but I also was a pop fan as well. And then as the eighties came along, it was like just a total tunnel vision of hard rock and metal. And so when I saw you doing country, I was like, uh, and I was like, country to me was always like, no, like, can't do it. But, you know, as I started doing this show, and, you know, we're open to all genres of either music or entertainment, you know, a lot of country artists started coming to us to be on the show, and I was like, uh, kind of cringing. But then I started listening to them. I was like, you know what, it's not bad. So it's like I've put down the walls finally, and 
just open my mind to other genres of music besides the hard rock metal and, or the pop or the, the 70s stuff that I like, or the 60s stuff that I like, and just decided, like, you know what, like, I just like music. Why can't it just be yeah, music? And it this is music. And, you know, I have, I have awards in my collection from playing jazz and playing classical music when I was growing up. I was a, a trained classical musician, and I was an accomplished jazz musician as well. And I learned when I was growing up, man, there was no musical prejudice. It's like, why, why, what, what does it matter the color of your skin or or the the style of music that you like? If it's good, it's good. If it's, if it, you should be judged by the content of your character, like Martin Luther King said when in his famous "I Have a Dream" speech. We should be judged by the content of our character, just like our music should be judged by the content of its character. And uh, if it's good, and if it, if you like it then it's good. That's, all, that's the only criteria, man. If you like it, it's good. It's, that's, right. that's as simple as that. And uh, it, it goes back to the early 90s when I was uh, struggling with my band Fair Game after Keel, and uh, mm-hmm. I was making a lot of road trips out to Arizona. I'd go from L.A. to Arizona just to hit the mountains, man, just to go out in the mountains with my guitar and hang out with my dad and go camping and go hiking through the, the, the wilderness and the desert. And those 450-mile drives back and forth from L.A. to Phoenix – I was looking for something to listen to on the radio, and everything I heard on all the rock stations was crap. And I would hit the scan button on the radio, and I'd, I'd land on Garth Brooks, Travis Tritt, Dwight Yoakam, whatever, and, and that was good. It was it just sounded cool, and I enjoyed it, and I liked that what they were doing, and kind of gravitated toward that. Uh, let me also put an exclamation point on this topic by saying I'm not at home in either genre. Obviously, I am. Uh, I've got one foot on either side of the fence. I am the metal cowboy, and there, there's a, you know, it's, it's a split personality almost. And I don't like any kind of music that tells you what you have to do, what you can say, what you can't say, what you can do, what you can't do. Screw that, man. Right. I, I wrote a song called "The Right to Rock," and that song speaks about freedom of expression, the right to say what I feel, and the right to say it to you. I'm going to do it my way or not do it at all. Those are the lyrics to my signature song, which has gotten me through the last 30 years of my career. How can you deny me, you, not you, but anybody, deny me yeah. the freedom to do that? Give me a break, man. I wrote about it. I sung about the right to rock. It's not just the right to, to put your fists in your horns in the air and scream and, and sing with Marshall Lance. It's the right to sing, the right to feel, the right to do, the right to act, the right to live. And I wrote that, and I live by that creed. And I don't understand anybody who's ever criticized me for expressing my right to rock, my right to, to sing what I feel and play what I want to play. You're right. You're right. And, and hey, I, I'm one of the guilty ones. I did it myself. You know, I I, I, I downed you. I was like, I, I can't believe it. But, you know, it, I guess it was me just being immature. And I'm sure that's a lot of the other people being closed-minded and immature and now that we've gotten older, or I've gotten older, and realized that, you know what, the music is music, and you can enjoy whatever, as long as it's good. And if you're putting out good music, I'm enjoying it. Well, uh, I actually, I am putting out good music, and I'm really proud of this new album, Metal Cowboy. Uh, it does uh, kind of fuse together the heavy metal and cowboy influences. And just by the word cowboy, it doesn't mean it's country. It's cowboy, and that's that's a wild west kind of thing, man. That's a shoot from the hip, look them in the eyes, and you know, you know, take a shot of whiskey kind of thing, man. It's not it's not country. It's cowboy, and it, it's got that uh, that southwest wild west flavor to it that gives it an identity all its own. And this is my house, man. Metal cowboy is where I I love to be. It's, it's who I am, and you know, it's like your house. I mean, you're gonna paint your house whatever color you want to paint it. You're gonna grow right. whatever you want in your yard. You're going to put whatever kind of fixtures in your kitchen or in, you're going to put whatever kind of sheets on your bed, whatever you want to do. It's your house. You decorate mm-hmm. it. You you paid for it. Well, this is my house, dude. I'm, I'm going to decorate <laughs> it however I see fit, and I, I decorate it with the characters and the, the flavors that uh, populate my life, the singers, hookers, thieves, and, uh, you know, metal cowboys and cowgirls. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I love the one title of, of, of the song, uh, what would Skinner do? Thank you. Well, it's not just a title. It's not just a great title. It's a great song. And um, I'm really, really proud of that one. Frank Hannon did some great work on the, the lead guitar solos on that. And, uh, you know, Skinner was a big influence on me. 
in the 70s when I was listening to records, I mean, they had these 12 inch vinyl records. I'd have Van Halen, Judas Priest, Leonard Skinner, Foreigner, you know, I can kind of envision my turntable as we speak, and those were the records that dropped as I went to bed at night listening to rock and roll music. Skinner was part of that. Skinner was a rock band. Yes, they were a southern rock band, and this might be, you know, some bands might have been a commercial rock band, or the, and some other bands might have been uh, corporate rock, like Journey, but it was all right. rock. Back in the day, it was all rock, and that's what I am. I am rock. My new album is rock, and uh, if you want to you know, narrow it down to a finer classification and call it a uh, hard rock and southern country metal album, <laughs> that's your business. You know, to me, it's rock. Well, you want to play one of the songs off of there? I got four queued up. I figure I picked out four. I let you pick from which one you want to hear. Uh, I got Evil, Wicked, Mean, and Nasty, Long Gone Bad, What Would Skinner Do, or Wild Forever? Well, you know, I think Wild Forever has got to be the call here. It was one of those songs. It's, it's a pretty special tune for me. Uh, there's a lot of angry stuff on this record, a lot of uh, commentary about the world we live in and, and the government and, and all that. But Wild Forever is, is one of those positive songs that it's got to, uh, it's got to resonate with, with people that, that, that feel the same way that I feel. And, you know, you might only live once. We don't know what's beyond this. But we can be wild forever, and this is basically a shopping list, man. It was once I got into the lyrics, it was pretty easy. I want, I want to play hard. I want to sing loud. I want to do this or do that. I kind of just wrote the lyric and, and uh, came up with this great anthem riff, and uh, I'm really proud to play it on the Totally Driven Radio Show tonight. Here's Ron Keel from the Metal Cowboy album and a song called Wild Forever. Did I lose you? No, let's see. It's hmm. Well, it's playing, but it's not playing. <laughs> well, if you want to hear it, you should just buy the record. Go to ronkeel. dot com, and uh, you, know, you can download it on iTunes. Just search Ron Keel, Metal Cowboy. There's lots of ways to get this music, uh, other than buying it from the bootleggers who are already rampant after three weeks of release. The album is bootlegged to hell and back, and it, it's very distressing. You know the fact that you know we're working our asses off here, we're we're investing our own money, trying to do the right thing and 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 make a living, and people are just stealing it. You know it's it's uh it really really hits home when you put your own hard earned money up, and and you put your money where your mouth is. Uh, everything that you see Ron Keel do, uh, the book, the album, everything I paid for. You know I, there's no record company or PR firm or anybody like that behind me, uh, and that's by choice. It's because this is my house, and I'm going to own my house. And you're welcome to come hang out with me at my house, but <laughs> I'm going to own it. You know, I, I own this thing, and I'm in it heart and soul, hand, foot, mouth, and from, from you know, every aspect. Uh, this is very much a hands-on operation. So uh, I appreciate those people that uh, have shelled up their hard-earned cash. To, to buy the new record, the response has been off the chain, and I hope we can keep it going throughout the year. Now, that, you know, that's one thing I wanted to talk to you about, too, and it's pissing me off that this thing, it's actually, it says it's playing, but it's not. But, All right. um, with, with well, I'll just the, keep talking, man. I, I think I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk the, to rock. You get me wound up like this, man, you know, you never know where we're going to end up. With, with this modern era that we're in now of, uh, you know, not only social media, but the whole digital music and, like you're saying, people bootlegging the stuff. And I mean, like you have people who will go and put the full album like up on iTunes, like or not iTunes, uh, YouTube. It, it's yeah. like, yeah, I mean, that's just like, what the hell? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you basically, yeah. I mean, they, people steal it and they put it up there. It's like for free. It's like your hard work is gone. That's right. It's the nature of the beast. The technology is not our friend. Um, I love the fact that I can stay in touch with my fans via social media. I can communicate with people I love around the world via Twitter, Facebook, and my website, ronkeel.com. But it is, uh, it's not good for our business. It's not good for music. And uh, I will cite some simple examples. Back in the day, when I was growing up, we had very few sources for our information. 
if you wanted to find out about Kiss or Rush or Black Sabbath or Aerosmith, you would have to buy Circus Magazine or Hip Parade, or you'd have to watch Don Kirster's Rock Concert or uh, some of these. There was, there was a couple of shows on TV that showed bands playing live. There were a couple of magazines, and that's how you got your information. And then in the early 80s, when my career was, was starting to blossom, we had MTV. And that was the only source. Man, people would have MTV on all day long, and a million people would see your video at once. And then right. you know, you know, 100,000 of them would go and buy your, your album that day. Now, you have so many sources of information that nobody's getting in any information. You can put up a Facebook post, and a half an hour later, there's other posts that have pushed it to the bottom. And it, it never ceases to amaze me how many messages I get on a daily basis. Hey, man, you know, when are you going to put Keel back together and go back out on the road? Well, Keel's been back together for six years now, man. We've been all over the world. We've done some of the biggest uh, concerts and events worldwide for six years and released an amazing new album that a lot of people don't even know about. Well, whereas if uh, if it had been back in the day, it would have been a different story. And yes, these, this younger generation is absolutely appalled at the thought of buying music. Why would I buy music? I mean, it, it's it's a strange thought to them. And plus, I'll, I'll cite another example that I often like to uh, discuss. When I released, we released the Right to Rock in 1985. The suggested retail price of an album was 8.99. Nowadays. 30-something years later, the suggested retail price of an album is nine ninety nine. So it went up a buck. After 30-something years, man, you think the cost of living uh, increase has is, is not affected us? Uh, and we don't have a 401k, man. You know, these guys have devoted their lives to rock and roll and sold our souls and did what we had to do to, to follow our dream and, and this path. We don't, we don't have any retirement. There's no Medicare, Social Security, and, and I don't want that. I don't want to hand it. I don't want to earn my keep. But what do we got, you know, uh, to show for, for what we've done? There's a lot of these guys out there that are still working day jobs, literally, yeah. and they can they can go do their gig on the weekend, and then they're back to painting houses on Monday. I'm very thankful. I'm not one of those guys. My day job is being the president of Wild West Media uh, and kind of overseeing my career on a management level and, and being involved in the business aspect to such an extreme that there are times when – it all suffers. There's times when I got to put the business on the back burner and just sing some rock and roll, baby. I'm going to go out to a concert. I'm going to go on the road. I'm going to listen to some music. And whatever's piling up in the email inbox, that can wait because I got to rock and roll. And I have to choose those times when I can do that. But uh, it, it is what it is, and it's the world we live in. And those who can adapt survive. Now, how about like when the whole uh... – the grunge era came upon us. So, we're like, were you uh, like we were talking with last week with uh, Nadir Dupriest from London, and I brought this up to him. Like, he couldn't even talk about it. He's like, next subject. He goes, I, 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 I can't even talk about it. He goes, I was so devastated. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. He goes, I, I just ran away. He goes, I, 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 I won't even talk about it. <laughs> how do, Man, how you, know, you I, it? Luckily, and I am a lucky son of a bitch. I, I admit that a lot of what I've accomplished is hard work. There's a little talent in there somewhere, but there's a lot of luck too, man. And I was so lucky at that time to not even realize, man, I was I was looking at the world through my own Ron Kill rose colored glasses. I had no idea that Nirvana, Nirvana, I, I can't pronounce that. I can't even say it. Ah, next subject. No, uh, I, I, and Pearl Jam and all that. You know, I had no idea they were taking over because I was already exploring the next uh, the, the next mountain. I was climbing the next right. uh, mountain and, and looking for the next opportunity, the next challenge. And uh, it never really got me down. Uh, I know it, it really hurt a lot of guys that had built their lives around that rock star mystique or persona. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't do that. I I luckily was, was – and that's why country music, again, man, it saved me at that time. I was able to – to write songs, express myself, play with great musicians, play in a packed house with, with hot babes all over the place. We're singing about drinking and chasing women and making records and touring the world and making money. And so, you know, I was spared. I didn't, it didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't hurt me that bad. Uh, I thought it was over. Uh, like ballroom dancing 
or Bill Haley in the Comets. Man, everything runs its course, dude. Uh, right. So I thought, well, you know, it's over. It's run, run its course, and it did until, I think, what was it, 2008, Rock, Oklahoma brought it back. Yeah. Now, how about, um, I, I never knew this, but uh, we had Lita Ford on about a month ago, and she brought you up, and she said uh, that I, I, recently she made it sound like you guys were talking, and you asked her, um, I guess when she was dating Tony Iommi, they, they came to check you out as a, a potential singer for Black Sabbath, and you never heard back from Tony, and you always wondered what his opinion was, and you were asking That's her. That's pretty close, man. Good, good memory. Um, because I actually was the singer in Black Sabbath at that time when Kiel did our first show, and uh, Tony was dating Lita. Tony and Geezer and Lita came to the show, and okay. you know I was in the band. I have a signed contract to prove it, and you know it is what it is. Uh, I was uh, the whole story is of course in my book, even Kiel Life on the Streets of Rock and Roll. But you know I I never heard from them after that, and I always thought that it was because. They saw a different Ron Keel than the guy they wanted in Black Sabbath. A Keel show is very much uh, a lot of smiles, a lot of high fives, a lot of – it's you know, kind of a Van Halen kind of thing. Man. There's, there's a party right. element to Keel, and sure. there is no party element to Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath is dark and mysterious and tough and, and all that. Uh, kind of like an actor playing a role, I was ready for the Black Sabbath gig, and I had the show down. Tony gave me a set list to learn. We we were never able to get into a rehearsal situation because the drummer was not available at the time, so I didn't get to actually sing with them on stage, in a, you know, get between the lines, so to speak. And uh, they came out to see the show, not as an audition, not as to check me out. I already had the gig. But okay. after that, I never heard from them again, and I asked Lita. Uh, she was the only other person in that limo on the ride home that night you know, with Tony and Geezer, what did they say? You know, did they say he's not the guy? Did they, you know, whatever. Lita didn't remember. Uh, but, uh, yeah, Lita's, you know, she's a sweetheart. She's a good friend of mine, uh, someone that I, I certainly admire, respect, and uh, appreciate having in my life. And uh, we do a lot of stuff together. We're going to be at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp together next week with Judas Priest. How cool is that, man? Uh, That's awesome. Uh, it's it's a dream come true. It's my fantasy come true with with. Uh, being able to participate in Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp next week with, you know, Rob Halford. And uh, I've done a few of these camps with uh, Sammy Hagar. I got to actually jam with Sammy Hagar. Me and Sammy up there singing I Can't Drive 55 together. Yeah, give me a break. Nice. I got to, got to meet Roger Daltrey from The Who and sing wow. My Generation with Roger Daltrey. I mean, uh, so those, those, awesome. those Rock and Roll Fantasies can come true, and, and I, I do a lot of that. Lita's a big part of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, and, I'm glad to be doing that uh, event with her next week uh, in Las Vegas. That's awesome. Now, how about um, w- with your book now, Even Keel? How how long have you been working on this? I mean, you said it was something you really wanted to do for a long time. Well, obviously, any autobiography it takes a lifetime to write. And I actually started writing the book, it's got to be you know, 12 years ago. And went wow. through a number of different approaches and different drafts and different, uh, you know, but it ended up where every time I'd get on a plane, I'd write a story. You know, I'd find a, remember a story out of my career and I'd kind of collect these stories. But I, and it, I'll also tell these stories sitting around a bar at the end of the night, you know, asking, talking about the Bon Jovi tour or Gene Simmons or Ingve Mobstein or all the, the crazy stuff that I've done or all the, you know, the, the the drugs and the women and the, the travels and the music and the, the adventures and the journey. And I would write these stories down and collect them, uh, intending on putting them in book form at some point in my career. And over the last six, seven years, it got serious, and I started to, to actually put together Chapter 1, Chapter 2, and get, a, get an actual framework and format for the book, how I wanted it to be. If I was to read a book about a rock star, but what I wanted, what, you know, I wanted to create something that I would like or that I would enjoy that would entertain me. And the only way I finished it, to tell you the truth, was to put a hard deadline on it. It's got to be done by such and such date. And I wanted it to come out in conjunction simultaneously with the Metal Cowboy CD on January 28, 2014. If I hadn't put that hard deadline on it, dude, I'd still be writing it for the next 10 years. And there's a thousand <laughs> pages that I left out. 
There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to tell that, you know, there's just not room for it. Who's going to, I mean, you know, I could have written an entire book about Sealer, an entire book about Keel, an entire book about my country years, an entire wow. book about my last eight years in Las Vegas as a, a, a tribute artist or a, a Las Vegas show producer and all the experiences that I've been through living and working in the Las Vegas entertainment business the last eight years. So I had a lot of stuff that I had to leave out, and I kept track of that, and maybe we'll uh, we'll have a sequel at some point. But right now, man, it's it's absolutely amazing to me that I could – and I've got one right here. I've got a, I've got a stack of them, and I'm, this is my book. It's, it's just, To me, it's – it's amazing that I actually finished it. Sometimes I think that I'm still working on it. You know, and I look at it and I'm holding it in my hand right now, a copy of my my autobiography. And to me, it's it's a, it's a pretty significant significant accomplishment in my life and my career. And no, it's not perfect, but I think it's a very entertaining ride. And I think that the response that uh, the fans and the media have given me so far in the last couple of weeks it came out it's been pretty overwhelming. And now that it's out. I look at it and go, Man, this is my this is my private stuff. This is my story. You know, I didn't really mean to share it with everybody. I just wanted to write <laughs> it down. But I'm glad people are enjoying it, and I, I appreciate the response. Uh, the book just came out today uh, uh, as a, an ebook on Amazon.com as a Kindle ebook, and we've got Barnes and Noble and all the other ebook retailers uh, coming on board in the, the next couple of nice. weeks. So uh, the, the, the physical sales have been what's most impressive to me, and the European and Japanese response is blowing me away because these people, I'm telling you, with the postal rates and the, the, the you know, the, it costs so much to send a book of this size to Norway or Tokyo. These people are paying more for the shipping than they are for the book. The book is 17.99 overseas, 15.99 domestic. They're paying 20 bucks to ship because that's what it costs me to, you know, by the time you have, you pay for the shipping and the envelope, right. and the, the all that, forty bucks or, or more for a copy wow. of my books, or some people in Australia or Norway or all over the world. That response is blowing me away because you know, I mean, I I love rock and roll. I love a lot of. There's a lot of rock stars whose books I'd like to read. I don't know. There's too many that I would fork out forty bucks for, dude. You know, I mean, right? That's, <laughs> that's a lot of that's that's a lot of coin. I mean, I I mean, it's just amazing to me. And they're autographed. They're all signed, and you know. Uh, and I send out these autographed copies of the book all day long, every day, and it blows me away. Each one that I send out means the world to me because somebody somewhere forked out their hard-earned cash to read my story. How cool is that? That's awesome. Now, when you were writing it, did, did you like? Did anything like stand out? Like as you're writing it, like maybe I would have tried something a little different, or you remembered something and you were like, "Wow, I can't believe I actually did this." and Things like that, and, and was it also like, um, I, and I say this all the time, like I, I'm in therapy, I, I, I go, go to therapy once a week and all, and they always tell you to you know, write stuff down. So I always catch myself, I'll write something down, and this way I can see it on paper, and it's kind of like a, a therapeutic healing thing. Did you have any experiences like that as well? Absolutely. It was very therapeutic. Um, it, was a, it was a lot of fun, first of all, reliving all that stuff that I've done, but nobody – can honestly write their life story without having a few regrets. And there's things you wish you'd have done. And I talk about a few of them in the book. I come clean on a lot of stuff about decisions that were made throughout my career, uh, the places I should have been that I wasn't, things that I did that I shouldn't have done. And uh, I don't know if it was uh, cathartic or therapeutic in that regard, but I'm a different guy. Now that the book is finished, I can tell you that, man. It's kind of weird because I've read it now. I've read Ron Keel's life story, and I have to look at myself in that regard. I'm proud of it in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm proud of the fact that the book really does showcase my work ethic, my drive, my passion, my love of family, and the people in my life. There are a lot of people in the book that uh, you know I, I, I treat with with kid gloves. Uh, whether they're ex-bandmates, ex-wives, ex-girlfriends, nobody gets thrown into the bus but me. Uh, when it comes time to talk about my 17-year marriage to my to the mother of my children, which was a uh, a crazy time and a crazy situation, I uh, I take I take the rap 
you know, I'll, 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 for the sake of my children, uh, I'm not going to throw my ex-wife under the bus. She's the mother of my kids. She's sacred in, in that regard. Uh, when it comes time to, to talk about band breakups and splits, I do kind of gloss over it. Uh, I say we went our separate ways. I don't say he was an asshole and we didn't want him in the band anyway. And you know, right. you know I'm not I'm not stomping in shit. You know, I, I right. believe that the more you stomp in shit, the the worse it smells. Um, <laughs> and I didn't want the book to be uh, a sex and drugs thing. You know, I, I read Ozzy's book uh, during the course of writing mine. I don't read a whole lot of autobiographies because I wanted to approach mine with my own, you know, philosophy and my own uh, direction. But I did read Ozzy's, and there was, you know, 200 and something pages about drugs and alcohol and a paragraph about Zach Wilde or Jakey e. Lee. I wanted right. my book to be about music. Uh, I focus on the stories, what it was like singing in the studio, working with Gene Simmons. And there's a lot of music and uh, stories about my journey, the concerts, the the interviews, the gigs, the you know the experiences. So I tried to focus on that. And of course, I sprinkled in enough sex and drugs to keep people's interest. And anybody who wants the dirt, I think they're going to find some dirt in there. But now that the book's out. I'm getting all these responses. I had an interview the other day. This guy says, Ron, this is a pretty greedy tell-all you've got here. And I said, dude, this ain't a tell-half. <laughs> it's a half of what we did. And there, there's, there's thousands of women that are now pissed off at me because they're not in the book. Are you kidding me? Uh, oh, I, I, I kept it as clean as I possibly could. <laughs> but uh, And I'm not advocating drug use. I've been drug-free for seven years now, eight years. Um, and I'm not advocating it, but when it comes to the, telling the stories about how I did the vocals on all those Keel records and hit those high streams and stuff. Andy, I was doing cocaine. Uh, there was a lot of that going around, and I, I did not. I don't think I abused it, but I partook, and I, I admit that in spades in the book. I, I, I try and talk about that in a, in a way that doesn't advocate it, but does admit to, uh, to what I did because I don't think I could do it if I wasn't doing it honestly, and and. You know, I'm not going to write a, a fairy tale. I mean, it, it's a book about my life, and my life has not been a fairy tale. So, uh, <clears throat> even Keel the movie, when that comes out, who's going to play the, the part of Ron Keel? Nicholas Cage. <laughs> <laughs> I get that a look lot. You already had an answer all ready to go. <laughs> I, I just get that. People tell me, hey, you look like Nicholas Cage. So I don't see it. I don't think Nick sees it. But, uh, you know, apparently there's some resemblance there, so. I think Nicolas Cage would be the perfect choice to play the, the older Ron Keel. Uh, I think we have a few choices for the, the younger Ron Keel. It's funny, people will look at the, uh, girls will look at the book cover now, and they'll see the cover of the book, and they'll say, wow, you haven't changed a bit. <laughs> the picture was taken 26 years ago. Come on. Uh, it's, not, you know, it's, a, it's a classic Mark Weiss rock and roll photo from the streets of New York when uh, we were at our heyday in 1986. There's a lot of... Uh, rare vintage photos in the book, uh, some stuff that, of course, I had to use what we had the rights to, and, and uh, there's there's some special photographs in the book as well, not just text. There's a lot of uh, press releases and uh, reviews, both good and bad. There are uh, quotes from people in the industry. There are uh, quotes from people in my family, my friends, like Mark Ferrari and, and my Keel Band, my sister, my music teacher, we got quotes from all of them. Uh, there are song lyrics throughout the book. Each chapter starts with a lyric of a special song that uh, kind of captures the, the spirit of, of that chapter. So there, it, it is it is a book about music and about a musician who just tried to you know grow up and you know figure out all the same stuff that you try to figure out. How do how do we make a living? How do we have a good time? How do we get laid? And you know right. what's my life and what does it mean? Yeah, you know I mean, we're all in the same boat. So uh, what are the plans you got for the rest of uh, 2014? Now that your book is out, the uh, new album's out, what's the plan for the rest of the year now? Well, the you know the immediate plan now is to uh, to get out there on the road and play some shows, and, and we've got some big ones coming up, man. I start on tour March 7th in Sacramento, California, at the Boardwalk, uh, which is going to be renamed the uh, Twin Engine Saloon. For that night's big biker event, me, Frank Hannon from South Lake, going to be doing some metal cowboy music on March 7th in Sacramento at the Boardwalk. The following night, I'm opening up for Y&T at their big homecoming show at the Fillmore 
in San Francisco, which is, and it's a solo acoustic gig. I mean, it's me and my guitar. Frank Hannon's going to come out and join me for a few tunes. But then I, I walk out on stage. It's, it's Y&T's 40th anniversary homecoming gig in San Francisco, their hometown. And I'm opening this show. I walk out on stage in front of these, the, the sold-out crowd with just my guitar, tell my story, sing my songs, and do my gig. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a little scary, but it's, it's a great honor and a great thrill. I do a lot of these solo acoustic gigs, and another one of those is going to be on the 2014 Monsters of Rock Cruise, uh, which leaves Miami on March 27th, and I'll be out on the cruise with all my buddies like Tesla and Kicks and Winger and Quiet Riot and Rat, and you know, just the list goes on. Uh, so I'm, I'm really proud to be back on the Monsters of Rock Cruise for the third year in a row. And uh, get back from that, we do uh, the 80s Unplugged show in uh, in Florida with Frank Hannon and Mike Tramp and Ron Keel. It's kind of a three-man acoustic oh, cool. 80s Unplugged gig. Uh, then the next big uh, milestone on the, the horizon is Keel's 30th anniversary show at the M3 Festival in Baltimore, Maryland, on April 26th. Um, it's going to be uh, an amazing event for us, almost 30 years to the day after our first gig, and uh, to be on the main stage, and not to be first on the bill either. I think they're, I mean, we're not going on at like 8 in the morning or anything. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, we've got a good time slot on the main stage at M3. I mean, come on, man. It, it, what an amazing ride this has been. There's a lot more planned for, for the rest of the year in terms of concert appearances and, and things like that, but the next two months are booked solid. So uh, nice. I hope that everyone will keep up with me at ronkeel.com and uh, follow along as this journey continues. Awesome. I'm excited. This has been fun. This has Thank been a you. lot of fun, man. And, it and, you is. Know what? Well, if you're not it, having fun, man, why do it? You know what I mean? Exactly. I, I feel for anybody who doesn't love their job. I mean, it, it, it. I know there's a lot of guys out there that are busting their ass, a lot of men and women. I don't mean just guys. A lot of people out there that are busting their ass and uh, trying to make a living and, and do the right thing and take care of the people they love. I respect and appreciate that, and I am very thankful that I am able to do what I love for a living. Well, Ron, I want to thank you again so much. Hey, uh, real quick before I let you go and before we uh, get cut off the air, can I just get you to cut a quick ID? Uh, you know, this is Ron Keel, the Metal Cowboy. You're listening to Totally Driven Radio. You're not going to do the Bumblefoot thing for me uh, like like you did before I came on. Uh, this is Total Driven Radio. <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Not unless you screw it up. I mean, that that was him. That was all him. This is Totally Drunken Radio. <laughs> I'm right. Ron Keel, the Metal Cowboy, and I'm on Totally Drunken Radio. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll do a ride for you, brother. I know you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna cut this up for me. Uh, let's do it. Go for hey, it. Hey, this is Ron Keel, the Metal Cowboy, and you're listening to Totally Radio. Crank it up. Awesome. Ron, thanks so much. Everybody go to ronkeel.com, get the Metal Cowboy, buy his book, Even Keel, and uh, don't steal it. Don't, like, bootleg it. Don't do none of that crap. Buy it. Be real. He's being real with us, so you be real with him and buy it. Well, it, uh, enjoy it. You know, that's the most important thing. I mean, I know that it, these are luxury items. These are entertainment items. These are tough times for all of us. If you can't buy it, I get it, you know, and I appreciate the people that have. But uh, these are you know, these are for entertainment. I hope that if you do buy it, it's worth the buck. Absolutely. All right, Ron. Thanks again, and let's uh, let's keep in touch and uh, let's do this again when you're plugging some more stuff. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and I'd love to come on the show anytime you want. Awesome. And come come to Philly and play, man. Got to get back to Philly, man. Love that town. Absolutely. Love those people. Hopefully, sooner the better. <laughs> awesome. All right, man. Thanks again, and take care. Thank you. Rock on. All right, everybody. There he is, the metal cowboy himself, Ron Keel. That was awesome. A lot of energy. He's very happy and proud of what he's doing, and that's awesome. I love it. Dude, you're going to be able to put together your own, like, little metal festival soon. Dude, that would be awesome. <laughs> it would be the <laughs> – see, I'll be able to have, like, my own parade, like you said. Yeah, see? See? <laughs> I would love to do that, dude. I would love to put on a friggin' festival in Philly. Like, for some reason, the, the Philly rock scene has died, and it kills me. And I'd love to bring all these people here to tear up Philly, because Philly needs a good ass-kicking in the rock and roll world. 
So the main event is the uh, the the Runaways, right? Well, Joan Jett is uh, <laughs> avoiding us, and she will not. <laughs> she has de- she has cordially declined our invitation. So, <laughs> but we got Lita and Sheree on board. We just need Joan. That's funny. So, all right, well, we're going to get cut off the air. So thanks to uh, Ron Keel 